Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's great to be here in Cardiff today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the difficulty good, moderate people like everybody in this room have now communicating in an increasingly difficult, complex, extreme, populist world. And hopefully offer some humble solutions about how you might operate in the world that you're going out into. But first I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I got here. I used to be one of you. Um, I was a student uh, at Cardiff. I did a postgrad course in broadcast journalism. There were about 15 of us at the time. Um, and I have very, very fond memories of being here. Um, made great friends, learned a huge amount about journalism, about fairness, about impartiality, just about the technicalities of doing it. Every morning we had to get up really early, sometimes slightly hungover, and do T-line shorthand classes. I don't know if any of you have to still do that, but literally you'd have to do an hour of that a day, every day. And just to annoy your tutors, I can say, I never used it, not once, after leaving here at all, but they made us do it every single day. Um, I then left here and went to work for Scottish Television and got paid an absolute pittance, and I ended up basically fixing the photocopy and running the scripts for somebody called Kirsty Young, who some of you may realise she presents Desert Island Discs now, but was a big newsreader at the time. And I, I had a real sort of existential crisis of thinking, what am I doing? How did I end up in this position where I became a broadcast journalist and that's what you have to do? But I realised that I, it was only if I made it work for me that it was going to work. So I suggested stories, suggested ideas. Somebody else would nick them. Sometimes I'd get to do them. Sometimes I'd get on air. And just that relentless determination served me quite well. I ended up going to ITN. Um, I eventually I spent quite a lot of time there. I became program editor of ITV News. I worked at Channel 4 News. I worked at Channel 5 News. BBC News poached me to become the editor of their 6 and 10 o'clock news. And that was an extraordinary experience. Um, I, and during that time, I had amazing stories that I got to cover. I, I got to see the world. I got to do what I wanted to do, which was have a front row seat. At history, as history was being made. You know, I got to go to Iraq and Afghanistan during the wars. Um, I covered amazing stories. There was one story you won't even remember, but when I was 22 and I was just new to the job at ITN, there was a baby who was kidnapped. And it became this nationalist session in the UK. Where was this baby? How could a baby be kidnapped from a hospital in the UK? And I got to know the police. And they phoned us in the early hours of the morning, three weeks later, and said, if you come to this location, you'll see Abby Humphreys, which was the name of the baby, being rescued. And we got this shot of a six-foot-four <coughs> burly policeman carrying a baby out of the house. And it won that year's RTS award because it was like we were there when the news was happening. And that, for me, get, got me the bug of journalism. And I thought, God, at that moment, I realized I'm in the right place and I'm doing the right thing. And then in January 2011, um, David Cameron rang me up completely out of the blue and said, would you like to be my director of politics and communications? Um, and they say that curiosity killed the cat. Well, it nearly killed me. Um, <laughs> I agreed to go into Downing Street, really not knowing what I was letting myself in for. On one level, it was a complete blast. We would end up getting invited to the White House, and there'd be a dinner that was being held for us, and George Clooney would be there, and I'd be sitting next to him and talking to him. Or I'd be on Air Force One. Or you're in extraordinary situations like going to Myanmar. Naypyidaw is this weird city that the dictatorial generals have, have um, created in the north of um, what was Burma, now Myanmar. And them trying to serve us what they thought was European food. And it started with garlic soup. And it wasn't really garlic soup. It was really liquidized garlic cloves that had been reheated that I could taste for about three weeks afterwards. And I was sitting next to one of the generals, and his English was a lot better than my Burmese. And he said to me, um, you know, he obviously wanted to get something off his chest. And he said, well, lately people have been accusing me of um, kidnapping soldiers. Um, but I have never kidnapped soldiers, and I have certainly never beheaded any soldiers. And I was thinking, I wasn't thinking that you had done either of those <laughs> two things until, until you mentioned it. But anyway, those are two just things that occurred to me, like just the bizarre experience of being in Downing Street. And it was a great experience. But there's another side to it, too, which I describe as like being thrown into the white water rapids. 
Um, I was expected to be across everything from moment one, and no allowance was given to me being new to the job. And there was a period where I wondered if it was possible to join the fast-flowing stream of government and not bash my head on the rocks and drown. Loads of people come from outside politics into politics, and the skills that have worked so well for them in, the more, in, their, in their previous job really don't apply in politics anymore, and they find it very hard. To change metaphors, I soon realized I was an unwitting frontiersman, entering a world where traditional ideas about how we communicate were changing irrevocably and at lightning speed. And I want to talk to you about how I think that's the wor world that you're entering now. It was clear it was a place where the task of a communications professional had never been harder. When I first entered journalism, people lamented the fact that the old certainties of a news cycle with fixed points of morning newspapers and evening news bulletins was being overthrown by 24-hour news. People warned that the concept of breaking news, which is the very essence of 24-hour journalism, was in fact breaking how we do the news, meaning precious thinking time alongside the ability to research stories had been destroyed in the headlong rush to be first. How naive we were. When I entered Downing Street, it was clear that the era of 24-7 news was comparatively easy, replaced by something more like 3D, 360 media culture, where news can be coming at you faster than you can think, and the next deadline is the amount of time it takes somebody to bash out a tweet. To make things worse, it was a clear political campaigning and its reporting had become an increasingly unedifying sight. Fearing being drowned out in a world that demands rigidity and adversarial comment, stories were more often being reduced to the most basic, frequently no more than mudslinging. Arguments were reduced to a simple core that paid no heed to nuance, no quarter given, because to do so was to open yourself up to the accusation that you admit you are wrong. Partly responsible for making the bed it had to lie in, government was hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with this. When problems hit, and they were constant, the sheer act of convening a meeting of the key players, each demanding a say in the latest turmoil, could be torture. By the time you'd eventually got them together, there'd been several more digital iterations of the story that they were barely even aware of. It was, it was necessary to develop strategies to cope or drown in the digital swamp. It wasn't always easy to persuade government departments or even the Prime Minister that digital revolution had changed the world and they must change too. That meant trusted people being allowed to respond quickly, to circumvent the sclerotic process and use communication that was fit for the new age. More often than not, that meant me pulling out my smartphone and trying to change the story by making a tweet or an Instagram or Facebook post. David Cameron was at first derisive about social media. Interviewed by Christian O'Connell, he famously declared that it was his belief that too many tweets make a twat. <laughs> he was shocked to learn that he had used an offensive term, and there were complaints to the regulator Ofcom, who finally ruled that they were satisfied he had not realized he was referring to a part of the female anatomy. My issue with what he said was that he was assuming that social media was just a playground for trolls and narcissists, and a large part of it still is, and it certainly was, but I had to persuade him that the facts were undeniable. The internet had changed everything about communication, and we had a choice to embrace it or be punished by it. Let me explain why. Firstly, it was where people were increasingly migrating. Someone once asked, why do people rob banks? The answer came back, because that's where the money is. For me, any communications professional ignoring the internet or social media was increasingly like having an orchestra without a string section people were massing online. At the same time, newspapers were changing dramatically. It was increasingly clear to me that the concept of a newspaper was a misnomer. A better name would be campaign papers. Think about how rare it is for a newspaper front page to cover straightforward news, instead of sifting information in order to push its own worldview or agenda. At the same time, journalism, print and broadcast have become much, much more stretched. And this is the world I think you'll be going out into. The average reporter filling several time, filling, filing several times a day, thinking about online blogs, vlogs, tweets and all the rest, little time to dig, and with news desks craving flavoursome, hard-hitting copy, sometimes interested in sensation more than they were in understanding. As comment has replaced news, it has become increasingly difficult to get your story across in a way that isn't seen through the lens of somebody else's worldview. I'm not complaining, but that's just the way it is. 
But to ignore social media in that light seems crazy to me, and you would be surprised how many organisations haven't properly taken it on board. Just look at the statistics. You can't ignore newspapers and broadcast news. They are still highly relevant, but they are diminishing rapidly. Take a look at the recent numbers for the sale of hard copies of newspapers in the UK. The Sun was down 1.4 million, or 8.7% year on year this year. The Daily Mail was down what, to 1.3 million, 11.2% down year on year. The Times, 0.4 million, down 4.1%. And the Daily Telegraph, in one year, went down to 0.37 million. That was a drop of a quarter of its readership. It wasn't long ago that the Daily Telegraph had a million readers. Their digital versions simply aren't replacing these readers and certainly aren't replacing the, ve the revenue. The story of terrestrial television is equally grim. According to Ender's analysis, the average age for BBC One is 61, BBC Two, 62, ITV, 60, Channel Four a little younger, 44, and Channel Five, 58. Increasingly, terrestrial television news is a place for the late middle-aged and the elderly. The young are opting out or not being engaged with properly. In politics, where constant communication, the ability to deal with a crisis is a daily, even hourly event, the case for making a digital strategy central was compelling. As I've moved from politics to consultancy, I've been amazed by how few businesses or people that are part of the general establishment in this country have been prepared to fully embrace digital as a means of communication. The reason for that is it's just possible to hang on to the analog way of doing things, and the constant crisis situation of politics isn't present. But what happens when you do hit a crisis and you're entirely reliant on others to tell your story? If you're trying to do that with newspapers or television news, you're always going to be shone through the prism of somebody else's thinking. The digital revolution has passed by the communications departments of big organisations. Many are happy to market digitally, but they won't communicate digitally, and there is a difference. They see it as like carrying the proverbial Ming vase packed with nitroglycerin across a polished floor. In other words, just not worth it. One CEO I was speaking to of a major international business blanched at my suggestion that he and his company communicate as well as market on Twitter and LinkedIn. He pushed back hard. Perplexed, I asked him if he would consider boycotting newspapers. He said, of course not. I then asked if he would never do TV or radio. He told me not to be ridiculous. My final question was obvious. So why wouldn't you use the most fertile ground for communication that there is? I think there are two reasons. One of them is prosaic practicality, and the other is based in fear. Business and public bo bodies often see social media as another way to sell products. Therefore, digital channels become the domain of a marketing department. The fear part comes in as people increasingly see social media as a loaded gun, with countless cautionary trails of people who have used it to shoot themselves in the foot. My favorite examples included the potential prospective Labour candidate who tweeted, God, this fair trade organic banana is shit. Can I have a mo modified, slave-grown, chemically enhanced one, please? He followed it up with, made my connecting train, no first class one was available, it would appear, sitting opposite the ugliest old boot I've ever seen too. It was extraordinary that somebody who was running for parliament thought that that would never be seen by anyone. The tweets were stored up by Conservative Central Office and were used to sink him in the campaign that then followed. Then there are people who simply don't understand the functions of Twitter. When I was in the coalition government, the Lib Dem cabinet minister, Chris Hewn, thought he was direct messaging someone, but sent to all his followers, from someone else, fine, but I don't want my fingerprints on the story, see, thereby ensuring his fingerprints were all over the story. <laughs> to use an example specifically relevant to business, Elon Musk tweeted, I'm considering taking Tesla private at $420, funding secured. After the joy of a share price hike, he had to row back in the face of several lawsuits and accept that he would eventually have less control of his company because he wasn't seen to be running it effectively. These are all cautionary tales, but they are basically people not looking before they leap. The key is to make sure you, are, you have processes in place to ensure that that kind of thing doesn't occur, because the ability to have your own channel to communicate without someone else interpreting it has become a luxury, not a necessity in the modern world. To add to the complications, we've seen the growth of fake news, and I'm sure on this courses that you've done, you'll have talked a lot about that. 
the phrase of fake news has been overused to the point of meaninglessness. Now a get out of jail free card for anyone seeking to claim a story that is essentially true is in fact false because a few holes can be poked in it. Don't get me wrong, pure fake news is out there and it is insidious. I find a lot of the young people in my business telling me that MMR vaccines cause autism or that the vast conspiracy theories about 9-11 are true <laughs> and so by the way are the ones about the lunar landings extraordinary. These are educated people. But I believe there is something just as insidious that we don't pay enough attention to. It's been with us for as long as societies have been formed and it's something the powerful have always attempted to use as a means of controlling the agenda. It's taking a grain of truth, then magnifying and amplifying it beyond recognition, stripping away context and presenting it as reality. And I think that that is something that you all need to be aware of in how debates are formed and how stories are processed. What is the agenda of the person behind the person behind this and how are they selecting that information and stripping away the mitigation it's an extraordinary thing it happens all the time I have two anecdotes one I can laugh about and one that troubles me still the first begins with the Daily Telegraph running a story that David Cameron planned to cut the SAS for a man who is known for his refusal to get riled I've rarely seen him more irritated the story was untrue but he felt he was a victim of a campaign where the military and journalists were forming a coalition to weaken him and make sure he couldn't reform the armed services at all. They wanted to stop any form of interference in the armed forces. MPs and Conservative Party activists, who are no different to anyone else in that they believe what they see in print, were contacting him and asking him how he could break one of the most sacred of Conservative covenants. I spent the morning ki killing the story. And by the time we were due to get on a plane for a trip to Libya, Liberia and Algeria, I had thought it was dead. We were due to go to the back of the plane for the traditional huddle with the media, which is always one of the worst parts of a director of communications job. The Prime Minister directly in front of a pack of journalists who can ask him anything. And I was telling the Prime Minister to leave it alone. He really didn't need to touch this story anymore. I'd killed it. Nobody else was going to follow it up. He agreed that he wouldn't mention it. But the first person he saw as he approached the back of the plane was the Daily Telegraph journalist who'd written the story. Dripping with sarcasm, he congratulated them on their scoop. He went on, but you missed two very important details. I'm also going to axe trooping the colour and get rid of the red arrows. Now for foreign people in the room, trooping the colour is um, the Queen's birthday and the red arrows is this stunt jet thing that no Prime Minister would ever cut. He was. He would, they would never do such a thing. He was saying it to say, your story was rubbish. And with that, he turned on his heel and walked back to his seat. I was a little flummoxed thinking, thanks, Dave, um, but was forced to say, for the avoidance of doubt, the Prime Minister was using irony to make the point that the original SAS story is not true. It was a joke. Please do not pretend it was serious. As we swept across North Africa, news reached me that some of the hacks were planning to write the story. I found them and said it would be a deliberate lie. When the trip finished, our plane was just arriving into Heathrow, and as it did, as you come into airspace, my, my smartphone came alive with all of the different stories that were being covered from the trip. And the first one that came up was the front page of the Daily Mirror. And there was a big picture of the Red Arrows doing a stunt, and underneath it, Red Arrows face axe. Secret Prime Minister's plan to axe stunt troop. I unbuckled my seatbelt and started walking to the back of the plane and the stewardess was shouting at me to sit down that this was highly inappropriate. Later I called the editor and I told him that it was a straightforward lie and it was extraordinary to see that on the front page of a national newspaper. He started by trying to take refuge in the fact that the Prime Minister had in fact said this was the case. I told him if he told, tried that one I would say that it was, um, it was a lie and I would take the unprecedented step of going out and saying that to everyone. He asked me to leave it and that he would fix it in the next day's newspaper. I got up bright and early and got a hard copy of the mirror and I turned through it, page one, two, three, nothing, eight, nine, ten, nowhere, 19, 20, 21, nothing. Finally I reached page 27 and there was the story proclaiming victory for the mirror's campaign to save the Red Arrows. The claim was that David Cameron had immediately buckled under the awe-inspiring power of the Mirror campaign. 
I can have a rueful smile about that now, but I struggle a little more with a story that came out 11 days before the EU referendum vote. The Sunday Times had got hold of some diplomatic telegrams from our embassy in Turkey, or at least bits of them. They claimed they were making the case for a million Turks to have visa-free access to the UK. This was incredibly controversial and toxic. Immigration had become the number one issue of the referendum. I'll leave you to decide whether there were any racial undertones to the story. When I reviewed the diptails, it was clear they were not as presented. In fact, the embassy was giving a roundup of policy in the area and what the Turkish government wanted. In no way was this being suggested as government policy, intended or actual. I hit the story hard, giving the Sunday Times a joint statement that was unprecedented from the Home and Foreign Secretaries, saying the story was utter rubbish and it had never had been or would be government policy. I knew they wouldn't drop the story, but the next day I was genuinely shocked by the coverage. The front page of the Sunday Times headline, its splash was, leaked UK plan to open doors to one million Turks. The subheading was proposal under wraps until after EU vote. The first witness in the story was Ian Duncan Smith, a cabinet minister, or he'd resigned as a cabinet minister, who claimed the government was in cahoots with the commission of the EU to perpetrate an appalling deceit. Our rebuttal was buried at the very end of the story on page three. Why do I tell these anecdotes and spend so much time on it? Well, partly because anybody who's worked in communications at number 10 is in desperate need of talking therapy, but mainly because they are extreme examples of why you cannot expect your story to be told straight. And if I had one message to anybody in this room who's going to be a journalist is don't be that journalist. <laughs> don't do it. It's not what you got into it for. It's not what you're about. It's not true. It's not OK. Don't do it. And don't listen to anybody who tells you that that's what you should do or that's the kind of journalism you should be engaged in. Sorry to get serious. Um, and before anyone asks, yes, there are plenty of examples of misleading politicians. My point is not that politicians who need to take heed. The businesses and institutions which make up the rest of the establishment also need to worry when the tide is turning so fast and this kind of behaviour goes on. Perhaps not mu as much as politics, but they do need to worry about it in a fast-changing world where they're increasingly seen as a bogeyman responsible for the ills of the world. With this in mind, it's crucial that every organisation asks some fundamental questions. And if you're going to be joining the journalistic world or institutions, whatever, I think asking these questions is, what is our story? Who are we? What are we about? What are our values? And do we share them frequently enough with our readers, customers and clients? Are we telling our story or are we just trying to fend off the negative image others portray? And if we could somehow, as if we could somehow defend ourselves to glory? With some honourable exceptions, there are too many that are not doing any of this or asking any of these questions but aren't fit, and aren't fit for purpose in a digital age. Because the truth is, you're entering a world where you have to fill the vacuum or it will be filled for you. You have to tell your story or it will be told for you. This isn't easy. It involves risk-taking, moving out of your comfort zone, and that is made harder by the final area I want to talk about today before you can ask me some questions. We're living in a world where the old rules no longer apply, but many still cling to them. I think looking at young people in a room, that, that, that there's this assumption in terms of people who run the country and maybe even run these courses, that, that there's a certain rule to how life works, that there's a conventional pattern of a successful life, which is get educated, work and earn and retire. But I think if I were in your shoes, I would think, isn't that hopelessly optimistic and values have changed accordingly? The world isn't quite as you keep telling me it's supposed to be. I might have to have several careers. I might have to retrain. I might not be able to retire. I might not be able to own property. But you keep shaping the world as if that's the world that I'm entering and living in. In politics, people bl blindly follow supposed rules all the time. The golden rule was until recently, the candidate of party who makes the best case on the economy will win. It's best summed up by the quote from James Carville when he was running the first Clinton campaign. It's the economy, stupid. A version of that statement had been behind every successful political campaign for the last hundred years. All that came crashing to a halt in the UK-EU referendum. 
At 10 p.m. on the night of the result, you could not find a single person who thought Leave had won. The polls were clear, with Peter Kellner predicting an eight-point lead for Remain. The currency markets were buoyant, and even, even Nigel Farage was um, saying that he was conceding that he'd lost. Then the very first results from the northeast of England came in, and they pointed to a shock. Areas that would almost certainly be badly affected by leaving had voted out. Wales voted out. It was clear from that moment Remain had lost, and the normal rules were no longer applying. It was a real shock to the political class and the establishment. As I sat in David Cameron's study at 4 a.m. on the morning of the 24th of June 2016, agreeing that he had to resign, it was clear that something seismic was going on, something no one had spotted. And the shocks have kept coming. Trump, Cinque Stella in Italy, AFD in Germany, Macron and Marine Le Pen, Sweden, Hungary, the resilience of Jeremy Corbyn. There is no doubt the center of the political universe has shifted towards populism. And as it has done, economic thinking has shifted towards the left. The familiar assertions about how capitalism should work aren't so popular anymore. The Anglo-Saxon model of quarterly reporting, the bottom line, and the shareholder as king is being questioned left, right, and center. The establishment is struggling to keep up. They aren't the only ones. Pollsters have learned to their cost that they need to adjust not according to where a person finds themselves on the economic scale, but on where people place themselves culturally. There have been a lot of attempts to define this. Slightly insultingly to his opponents, Tony Blair refers to two tribes, one open, the other closed. David Goodhart wrote of anywheres, metropolitan, liberal, university educated, open to the world but unrooted, and somewheres, the more locally rooted for whom national sense of pride is everything. Others say globalist and nationalist. Whatever the best way to describe it, there is a deep schism in developed Western economies between those who are comfortable with the modern world and those who are not. And the establishment had better find a way to navigate it. Metropolitan liberals like me were convinced that the arguments over globalization and immigration had been won. They hadn't been. And a vast number of elections have shown how to varying degrees people have revolted. All of this requires some serious thinking from people who are entering a communications business. There's no signs of things becoming more stable. I've just read Yuval Noah Harari's follow-up to Sapiens and Homo Deus. It's 21 lessons for the 21st century. And it can be summed up as Brexit schmexit. Brexit is compared to the far greater problems like artificial intelligence and climate change, which are largely being ignored. Brexit in this country has become a planet-sized issue that's so close in our vision that it's basically obscuring a whole universe of other issues that we're going to have to face. The former Foreign Secretary William Hague points out that the most significant speech of the last 20 years was not given by a Western politician, but by China's President Xi at last year's People's Congress. He took four long hours to make the compelling case that contrary to our long-held beliefs, liberal democracy is not the only workable system. China now has an alternative. Long-term planning without all the short-term instability of a disruptive electoral cycle. Xi's point was he, or someone very like him, will be there in 10 to 15 years' time. Recently, we have wondered if our prime ministers will be here in 10 to 15 days. In fact, scratch that, 10 to 15 hours. <laughs> Brexit, AI, climate change, the rise of China, these are massive topics. What have they got to do with the people who are studying journalism, communications, and politics? Where people wonder just how they're going to keep the show on the road and help, the, help our society to prosper. I just want to take a little moment to summarize and explain what I'm trying to say. The world is changing at an alarming pace. Many are deeply uncomfortable about that. The establishment is being blamed. The establishment must change its communication strategy. You guys are essentially entering a world where you will be part of that establishment, whether you like it or not, or you never thought you would be in that establishment. And yet, too many organizations haven't begun to grasp the basics of communicating in an incoherent world. Have we worked out our position in a world in flux? What do we have to say to people, particularly young people like you, who feel that the way things are in general is actively contributing to their problems? Do we know how to communicate properly in a digital world? Are we horribly and hopelessly behind the curve? 
Let's try to end this by bringing some clarity. This is no time for faint hearts. The world is changing at an alarming pace. You will be at the centre of it. Our national and international debates are increasingly the preserve of ideologues, fanatics, tribalists and cranks. To quote William Hague again, the bull is in the china shop and the display cases are crashing all around us. What do the quiet and reasonable have to say about this? What will they do when it is their turn to take charge? It seems to me universities need to take up their role as the voices of reason and free speech again. Business needs to make the case for the contribution it makes. The establishment needs to stand up. That means refusing to duck beneath the parapet or hide in the shadows, fearful of being singled out and criticised. I'm not advocating commenting on every issue, but I do believe it's time to resent a countervailing narrative to the one that says we are hopelessly out of touch and that the only solutions are populist ones. It's time to realise silence has a price. Vacuums are filled. If you don't define yourself, others will define you. The Brexit referendum was a case in point. The establishment paid a very heavy price for not making the case for something it believed to be vital over decades, thinking others would simply surely get it. They didn't. The ostrich posture failed, as it always will do. We have become too used to letting others speak for us. Too many of the people who speak up now have chosen divisiveness over compromise and cohesion. Those aren't bad words, although you often think that when people are talking about them that they are. Compromise and cohesion are vital. And they may just help us to save things that were fought over for many generations and we've taken for granted for too long.